this subject is a very hot topic and also very difficult. And also we have to understand exactly what it is. And we have a beautiful panelist here, Jean-Michel and Naomi and Tony, all of them, and Peter too, volunteering tonight. And thank you for that. So now, I don't want to have a debate here. I want to have a conversation and discussion. And of course, we had the perfect moderator and MC, Peter Haworth, here. <laughs> so now I am going to introduce about Peter Haworth. And he has been, and he worked with the Marine Mammals for more than almost 50 years. And also he got so many awards, nationally or locally. And some of them are actually my late husband, Fred Benko, got few too. But he uh, complained, Peter always got first. <laughs> and he, Fred is always second. But now, Peter served as an actor advisor for the Cousteau team when you are doing the uh, two, two hours of the documentary is the Channel Islands. He did. And then Peter also served as an advisor for the, uh, oh no, excuse me, the, um, oh, some of the uh, awards he got is the uh, E Achievement Award and a local hero by the Santa Barbara Independent and the Santa Barbara White Care Network Awards and the Kuril Awards and the NOAA Environmental Hero. And he was a member of the uh, Scientific Advisory Council of Channel Island National Marine Sanctuary and one of the uh, founding directors of this museum, Maritime Museum. But Peter's most significant contribution has been a director of Santa Barbara Marine Mammal Center, and he founded in 1976. And this, <laughs> and this organization rescues sick and uh, injured <coughs> sea lions and uh, seals and also as well as gill-netted, I mean, is the dolphins and the whales in, captured in a gill-net. And so, they do take in for treatment and return to the wild, and that's what he does. And he has been doing for almost four decades, and uh, his success rate is almost, I, I think, is one of the top in the nation. And actually, he is my hero. And I'd like to introduce you, Peter Forward. Well, I have an old joke about uh, lining up in alphabetical order according to height. I guess. They finally pulled it on me. Now I'm uh, alphabetical order according to height. I'm not sure how that works out. You know, I'll let you figure that out. Um, OK, I want to introduce the panelists, but first a little bit about this uh, event. Uh, we're going to um, let the panelists talk for about seven minutes apiece and uh, just present their views on cetaceans in captivity, especially orcas. And then we'll have a few questions, uh, general questions that I think many of you have in your own mind. After that, uh, we'll have the panelists, including me, uh, answer any specific questions about cetaceans and captivity. We're trying to keep this civilized, not make it into a big shouting match or anything else. And also, we're trying to avoid long-winded monologues. So those of you in the audience and the panelists and me, if you stand up and start talking and talking and talking, not asking a question or not answering it, it's my job to 
cut you off. So we're told we're, we have to get out of here by 8.30, or each of you will have to donate $10,000 to the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. <laughs> okay, so we're going to try to keep this on track, on time, in focus. A um, little bit of introduction. The, the old eyes aren't what they used to be, but uh, Naomi Rose, <laughs> whom I just met this evening, um, marine mammal scientist for the Animal Welfare Institute in Washington, D.C., and she's worked on several campaigns and coalitions addressing problems associated with cetacean live capture trade and captivity in the U.S. and abroad. She's been a member of the uh, IWC, and most of you know that's International Whaling Commission, Scientific Committee since 2000, where she participates in subcommittees on environmental concerns and whale watching. She's authored uh, over 30 scientific papers and numerous articles, along with chapters in various books, lectures annually at various universities, conducts workshops, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, testified before the U.S. Congress a number of times. And um, just about everything you can imagine she's been doing for cetaceans in captivity, that's her. Uh, Tony Fruhoff. Tony's the principal scientist for Protect Our Dolphins of Santa Barbara. It's a nonprofit uh, that she started when she moved here in 2010, and also the senior scientist and instructor for Terramar Research and Learning Institute, and an author working on her third book about dolphins. She specialized in the study of dolphin and whale behavior, dolphin psychology, and dolphin welfare, both in captivity and in the wild for 30 years. Conducted the first research on captive dolphins and uh, used to swim with the dolphin programs, as well as the first study of captive dolphins used in petting and feeding pools. She's also contributed to quite a number of scientific works and popular uh, articles and chapters and lectured widely, and the credits go on and on. We've been involved in numerous TV productions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Jean-Michel, old friend. <laughs> dear friend, longtime supporter of, of our work. Uh, undersea explorer, I think, uh, he doesn't need too much introduction. I have a 73-page uh, brief bio from Jean-Michel, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. <laughs> At any rate, he's the, uh, the founder and uh, basically in charge of uh, Ocean Futures Society, which, if you don't know, is here in Santa Barbara. Um, but Jean-Michel goes back a little ways as far as uh, getting underwater and getting involved with the water planet. He uh, was thrown overboard by his father with scuba gear at the age of seven. It was the first uh, scuba certification. Uh, quite, a, quite a method to throw him over, and if he comes back up, then I guess he's certified. <laughs> but he, he managed to make it, and he spent uh, decades, 50 years, some or more, exploring the oceans. Uh, I won't tell you his true age, but we'll, we'll stop with 50, uh, nor will I tell you mine. At any rate, Jean-Michel uh, was involved with the first attempt ever to return a captive orca to the wild. Uh, we're talking about Keiko, and that was a pretty amazing uh, event. It was the uh, captive killer whale of, of Free Willy fame. All of these panelists and Jean Michel first here, as he's, since I just mentioned him, but deserve a big hand. Okay, and I was asked to say something about myself, and Hiroko already said that, so I'm not going to do that. And uh, I think we'd like to start. Um, with about seven minutes per person, and we're going to try to keep this on the clock. And we're starting now. Um, we'll start with Naomi. Uh, just present your, your stance on cetaceans in captivity. So I studied um, killer whales in the wild for my PhD dissertation. I worked with the northern residents in 
Johnston Strait in British Columbia. And I also stopped at the Vancouver Aquarium whenever I went up north to do my work. I went to the University of California in Santa Cruz for my PhD. And whenever I stopped there, I was very, you know, happy to go behind the scenes to see Hayek, Biosa, and uh, Finna. But the longer I did my work up in British Columbia, the more I noticed how small the tanks were in this facility. And that's when I really started feeling that there was something wrong with the practice of keeping these animals in captivity. Then um, after I uh, was very close to finishing my PhD, I, I decided I didn't have the patience to be uh, a teacher. Um, I was just too eager to move on to the next thing and the students would be you know, uh, struggling to keep up. And it was, it was, I just didn't have the patience. So I decided I would try advocacy for a while. And that was 21 years ago. So I've been working on uh, protecting these animals, both in the wild and in captivity, for that period of time. And in that time, I work at the policy level. I work on legislation, regulation. I work at treaty organizations. And in that time, there's been a real change in the public perception of these animals when they're in tanks. And as we all know, four years ago, a trainer was killed at SeaWorld in Florida. And I'm here to tell you that changed everything. Obviously, for her family, it was a tragedy. But for all of us who have been concerned about these animals in captivity for that time, it changed the playing field. Since then, there's been a book published called Death at SeaWorld by David Kirby, which I urge you all to read, not just because I'm in it, but because it's a really good background on this issue. And then Blackfish came out in 2013 and absolutely changed the dialogue because so many people who had never thought about this issue twice saw the film and started thinking about how big these animals are and how small the tanks are. So I urge you tonight to ask us questions about anything that's been of interest to you or concerning you or puzzling you. And as you know, here in California, there has been a bill introduced, AB 2140, by Santa Monica Assembly Member Richard Bloom. I'm involved in that effort, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about that bill. Thank you. Well, and thank you, Naomi. That was uh, certainly less than the seven minutes. We do appreciate that very much. Um, OK. Um, next speaker would be Tony Fruhoff. Um, I guess this is ladies first. Um, thank you very much, Peter. And I would like to acknowledge uh, the courage and vision of Hiroko Benko for hosting this evening. This is really wonderful. And uh, I'm not sure if it was mentioned, but I would like to uh, reiterate, if not iterate, that uh, SeaWorld and, and several people from the representing the captivity industry were invited uh, for participation in tonight's panel. And uh, my understanding is that everybody who Hiroko invited uh, declined for, I'm not sure what the reasons, uh, but this was intended to be as open of a conversation as possible. And yes, we do want to invite the questions. And so therefore I'll keep my, what I'm going to share with you brief at first, because to me this is a community issue it's obviously an international issue as well. Some of you may have seen the movie The Cove um, and have seen the close connection between dolphin conservation and dolphin captivity and how intimate the two can be and unfortunately still are. There are orcas uh, languishing in captive facilities right now, even in the US, one orca named Lolita who is by herself. Sometimes they throw in a few dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, to keep her company. Uh, they know her family. There's a reintroduction effort that uh, would, would be really wonderful to pursue. Um, I don't consider myself somebody who's anti-captivity myself. I was trained as, an, as a scientist. I love the scientific method. And I'm also a naturalist. And I would presume that from most of you being here, some of you whom I know very well, um, love the ocean, and there's inherent appreciation of seeing these animals who have evolved for millions of years being in the environment to which they are so superbly and divinely adapted. And many people have for decades questioned the 
utility and the futility of keeping dolphins and including orcas, orcas are members of the dolphin family, in captivity. I've worked with <coughs> Naomi, we have the, we've had the pleasure to know each other and work together for almost 20 years, and so to have her out from DC is a pleasure. Um, and of course with Jean-Michel, this, this debate has been going on for quite a while, and we hope now we can find common ground and have conversation, because it's not a matter of getting rid of the captive facilities, it's about them being the best they can be. And now that we know more, we can do more and we owe more to the marine mammals who are in our care now. And uh, I think we know better than to remove them from the wild anymore. So I thank you all for coming. I look forward to what you have to say tonight. Wow. Another brief presentation. <laughs> Jean-Michel. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yorko. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, ladies, for um, opening the conversation on an issue which uh, will put forward uh, the uh, ability of the human species to understand another species, which, in my opinion, uh, can teach us a lot and happens to occupy six, seventy percent of the planet. Uh, I uh, had the privilege of uh, starting scuba diving when I was six, 68 years ago. Uh, and I've seen a lot of damage. I've seen a lot of these animals being captured and thrown in jail. Uh, we didn't know any better. And thanks to our team, and there are a few critical people here tonight, uh, Charles Vinick and uh, Jim Knowlton and Holly Lohais. Uh, we're doing what we're doing to communicate with the public. We want to make sure that education goes out there, is being shared with as many people as we can. We're not there to point fingers, we are there to provide the information for the, our decision makers and mostly our future decision makers who are the young people who uh, will make much, much better decisions than we made. When I was a kid, my father became uh, the director of the Oceanographic Institute in Monaco. He wanted to get more people come to the Oceanographic Institute than they had at the time. He had the idea of capturing some dolphins and putting them for show at the Oceanographic Institute Aquarium. His team was sent out. I was there. I was 14 years old. I was going to school every day with my <coughs> little bag. And I never stopped going to the aquarium. I wanted to see the fish from behind. I was feeding them illegally. Uh, and one day his team went out and captured some dolphins and I can tell you a long story but I'll make it as short as I can since these wonderful ladies gave me another three minutes each. <laughs> uh, they captured dolphins, wild dolphins, which some of them accepted being captured, others rejected it and were released ultimately, and some of them we didn't really know. One of them, after I went to uh, a swimming pool, which was Olympic swimming pool, to adapt them to captivity, for them to understand they were concrete, that was the limit of their world. And ultimately, most of them were released, but they kept a few, and one of them in particular I fell in love with a young female who may have been separated from her own children. And she was put away from the public in a small tank, much smaller than this room. And every morning I was going to see my buddy. And I kept calling the doctor, uh, saying something's wrong. I can feel something's wrong. 
And the veterinarian went and kept checking her up and would come back. And he would say, no, she's fine. She's OK. We did that three times. And I'm not going to bother you with the details, but ultimately, one morning, as I went to see her every day, she was dead. And what she'd done was to run from one side of the pool to the other and committed suicide because the veterinarian operated and told me, yeah, she blew our brain. I, obviously, for the rest of my life, and with a lot of emotion, I've always wanted to communicate to the public that we need to respect these creatures from which we can learn a lot. And when we had the opportunity with our team to take care of Keiko, we realized it took us four and a half years to put him back in the wild and give him a chance to go away. But he was attached to us, to humans. He didn't want to let us go. But he did go with some of his colleagues and went all the way to Norway. And our mission was done. But I realized that, you know, <laughs> not easy to get freedom back. So thanks to what I call the communication revolution, which is available to us today, when 7 billion people on the planet are connected to each other. I was in India not very long ago and in a room with one gentleman with one computer and he was allowing 100 people ask questions, not about India, but about the rest of the planet. Anything that is going on today on planet Earth can be connected to all of us on the planet. So we now have the tools which we didn't have before. We now have the ability to communicate with our decision makers who, in the past, have put these animals in jail and are trying to make money by making them do circus act, things which they don't do in the wild. Well, I can jump too, you know. You can make a fire hoop. If I'm wet, I can go through it, no problem. So we now are no longer in a situation where we are spectators that are being imposed a way of being entertained. We now have the technology available whereby we begin, become decision makers. We can sit and thanks to 3D and our way of communication, we can decide. We can make those decisions. And I can strongly recommend to those who have animals in captivity and orcas in particular, to continue to be a business, make a lot of money, liberate or never replace these animals that are in captivity, and make the public the decision makers. That technology is available today. We're going to see that happen. That's where we're going. Time is of the essence. We can be the leaders in this country, in this state in particular, and make much, much better decision. Let's not blame the past. Let's look forward to the future with the opportunities that we have to learn about these creatures and not just to make them do things which is totally useless for us to understand how we depend upon our life support system, which happens to be planet ocean. And those creatures can teach us a lot. And that's what we're doing today at Ocean Future Society. That's what we're doing to communicate with people. That's how when I sit down with a president of a corporation or a government or a governor, I don't point fingers. <clears throat> I reach their heart. And everybody has one, and we can make a difference. And that's where we need to go today. And I'm very, very excited, and I want to thank you for inviting me. I know that, you know, I've been 23 years in uh, Santa Barbara. Most people don't even know that. And that's OK, because I travel probably 80% of the time. But I was in Los Angeles before, and I had to move away from hell to go to <laughs> paradise. And I love Santa Barbara, and you can make a difference.
to communicate with our decision makers that they have an opportunity to be ahead of the game and make sure that they can look in the, the eyes of their children and their grandchildren and say, hey, look what is going on today and how much we're going to learn from these amazing creatures, which we have a lot to learn from, mostly because their primary sense is different than our primary sense. And to try to teach an orca English is stupid uh, or French. <laughs> we want to understand their communication systems. We want to understand how one pod can connect with another one. We want to understand why they avoid <coughs> each other. We want to understand why you have the uh, northern uh, hemisphere with some resident population and then others which are transient population. And they occupy the entire planet ocean. I have a confession to make, which I've made many times. I started out as a collector of marine mammals for people like the U.S. Navy and others. And many years ago, uh, out here in Santa Barbara Channel on the other side of Santa Cruz Island, uh, we caught a pilot whale. It was back in the old days, in the 60s or so, early 70s, and it was a great white hunter bring him back alive thing. We weren't hurting him, we were catching him. We thought this was just a wonderful, grand adventure. So we caught this pilot whale, and after about seven hours before we could finally subdue it and bring the animal aboard the boat we had and put it on a soft foam stretcher, water it down, take it into a captive pin that we had in Santa Barbara Harbor back in the Ice Ages. And the boat was slow, it was about a seven or eight knot boat, and all the way back the animal was vocalizing a lot, it was crying out. And the pod of whales followed it for the longest time. They were vocalizing as well, they were right there, right next to the boat, which we'd never seen before. And something inside me snapped, and I thought at that point, this great white hunter stuff is really not what I want to do. So I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. I don't judge people who do that or have done that. It's so e easy to criticize folks in light of our present enlightenment. We look back and say, you shouldn't have done that. Yeah, we shouldn't have won the West. Won, I don't know the way we did with what we did with the bisons and the American Indian people and everything else. Very easy to place blame. We have a lot of young people at Marine Mammal Center that ask us about these issues. And I try to invite them to, first of all, avoid internet as far as getting information. If you are interested in finding out about an issue Unless you really know without any doubt that a source on internet is accurate, you're going to get a lot of nonsense. And some of you know that as well as I do, probably, hopefully most of you. Um, and you really need to listen to both sides and make your own judgment. Um, and I think another thing is to follow the money. Uh, the panelists have mentioned that uh, marine mammals in captivity is a big money thing. Uh, environmental groups can be big money too. So you need to really think about where are the people coming from who are saying what they're saying. You'll notice I haven't said pro or con yet, but I think from earlier you kind of get an idea of where I lean after 38 years of rescuing marine mammals and not really making any money on that. It's a volunteer effort. Um, but this is what I advise young folks. You want to find Look at the issues, uh, research it thoroughly, follow the money. Um, another thing would be to ask if the person has worked directly at a marine life park. Do you have any experience? I have. I've also worked many years with many environmental organizations. So I, I think I could see both sides of the fence in that regard. And based on all that, make your own objective decision. Get the facts first, and then decide how you stand on the issue. Um, I look back in terms of history, I have to give some credit, Flipper was actually more than one dolphin, but without Flipper, people in the Midwest would never have voted in the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972, 
which resulted in federal protection for marine mammals. They would have thought a dolphin was a my my. Same thing with Shamu the killer whale. Terrible killer whale. Without these animals in captivity, uh, this enlightenment that we have now, it's so easy to throw out the baby with the bathwater, would never have come. We know about, uh, know now that uh, killer whales are orcas, we can call them that if we want, but they're just big intelligent dolphins. Um, I think without that knowledge, it'd be really tough. And if we look at sedation physiology, medicine, etc., none of the rehab centers really have the bucks to hold these animals in captivity and find out about them. Uh, sea World of San Diego rehabbed two gray whale calves, successfully released them back in the wild. Um, I can't put a gray whale in my backyard. Uh, none of the other rehab centers are able to do that sort of rehab. So there's some good things that have come from all this over the years. And yes, now we're, we're thinking in a different direction. Okay, we have the information we need. We don't need to do this. But I guess the other question would be at this point, if, if we do eliminate this, and it's a question for you, I think you know where I stand, but uh, who's going to rehab whales? Do we have the funding? It's realistic to expect that. Um, and let's look at um, threatened and endangered species. Uh, for a long time, the gray whale was endangered. It was on the endangered species list. And in fact, when the uh, first one was rescued and rehabilitated and released, it was an endangered species. So some of these institutions can do some good in that way, and they do have the money to do it. Um, I, I guess um, the other thing is captive-born animals, if, and it's a big if, we want to have cetaceans in captivity, um, does it make sense to breed them in captivity so that's the only life they know? And then if there is a need for these animals or if you can't get around stopping people from having cetaceans in captivity is having... Uh, captive-born uh, cetaceans, is that a reasonable alternative? So there are a lot of big ifs here. Um, we're going to have some questions about marine mammals in captivity and cetaceans in particular. I, I mentioned where I leaned uh, over 40 years ago in terms of cetaceans in captivity, but I wanted to open your minds a little bit only because so far, this is preaching to the choir. I think we've got three people who are prepared to very strongly say no cetaceans in, sec in captivity. I'm saying learn all the facts and make up your own mind. Personally, I already have. Uh, you know where I stand. But I think it's good to look at this objectively, really think about it. So we have a few questions now, which we'll get into. Uh, nope. I see your questions for the for the panelists here. Anyway, that's all I had to say about it. Okay. And I think that's already been answered as if any of the panelists have ever worked for uh, marine life parks. But I don't think worked any of them. For? Maybe some research or directly I've... working on the payroll. Well, not on payroll. I, okay. I volunteered at an early age at Marine Land of the Pacific in Palos Verdes and uh, have incidentally done some work at uh, facilities where dolphins were released to the wild. I had the good fortune of experiencing some of that. Uh, so I did get to see uh, a unique back, back room aspect to the captivity industry, but certainly not a lengthy one. Uh, I've done inspections for captive facilities around the world starting from the early 80s when the Bahamian government, uh, two veterinarians and myself as a behaviorist, 
were asked to inspect facilities there, and that became something yeah, that's that... That's I'm sorry, strained from the question, then. I'm trying to keep this on track. So well, let me reiterate inspecting then, Inspecting from somebody we, we else We would inspect the, the facilities and connect with the trainers and talk right. to them there. And so we got to see a unique view of that, and so that was really valuable. Right. That's fine. But no, the, the questions from the audience will come momentarily, Naomi. Yeah, I, I never actually panelist. worked in a marine park, but I worked with a um, captive research project in Hawaii. I worked with Lou Herman's lab for a semester. So I actually was training research dolphins okay, for, for great, a semester. Great. And John michel I think you mentioned your experience Well, I think I gave you my story when I was a kid and as a result of this catastrophe uh, with that young dolphin, my father never put them in jail again. That was it. Okay. Um, the next question is, should wild-caught dolphins or orcas be returned to the wild if they're, they've been in captivity? We'll start with Naomi and kind of move Yeah, I think that's um, something that keeps coming up in these discussions. Um, and certainly there are activists who believe that um, we should free all the whales and dolphins. But I'm a scientist, I'm a biologist first and foremost, and I personally believe that captive-born animals can't be returned to the wild. We all know that these are uh, intelligent, social, and cultural animals. They actually develop their own cultures depending on where they live. And uh, killer whales in particular are cultural animals and are very different depending on where you find them. They have different dialects, they have different foraging strategies. Those are all learned behaviors. So if you've been raised in captivity, that's all you know. That is your culture and it's actually a very um, uh, abnormal one. And so, in the end, um, I think the captive-born animals are going to have to be cared for for the rest of their life. I'd like to see breeding stopped. But wild-caught animals, in some cases very recently wild-caught, I see no reason why they can't be rehabilitated and returned to the wild. And there are now eight killer whales that were caught in Russia that I think are prime candidates for a rehab project, uh, although they're not available for such. And lots and lots of dolphins around the world have been recently taken from the wild. So that's a very different kettle of fish. Long-term captive dolphins who were wild caught have to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, that was actually going to be the next question. We're going to hold the audience questions until the panelists have answered these, these questions first. Um, and, and the question was going to be, the first one was wild caught, the second one was captive born. But, so let's, let's uh, go ahead with Jean-Michel as far as wild caught. Uh, Dolphin cetaceans, should they be returned to the wild? Well, uh, I, I think you've answered uh, part of that uh, very well. Uh, a recently wild caught animal can be put back in the wild if he or she is in healthy conditions. Uh, a, an animal that is blind, like I've seen some, you want to take care of them for the rest of their life. And of course, you cannot release them because they cannot survive. Uh, and what we, again, what we need to do is, through education, is to make people understand that we can learn a lot from them, and uh, let's go out there to watch them in the wild. And if you cannot see them in the wild because you live in Topeka, Kansas, uh, you can have a, a, th a theater, 3D theater, right there in your community, and you can learn and interface with them as much as you want. Now, uh, my example with Keiko uh, was thanks to our sponsor, we spent millions of dollars after four and a half years to release Keiko. And in as much as Keiko was free, and he was free, uh, he couldn't disconnect himself from humans. So he was not a real orca in the wild. Uh, what do we learn from that? Absolutely nothing. So, uh, or see, we learned that we shouldn't, we shouldn't put them in captivity. But I, I'm very much uh, in favor of educating the business of people who have animals in captivity to stop collecting them and replacing it with the interaction that we can have where we are the decision makers and they, these people, these businesses, will make a lot of money. I'm on their side. Business is business. And I don't want them to go out of business. I want them to continue to educate us. 
and the right way, and it can happen, and we can do it. And I'm sure that's where we're going to go. The time is of the essence, but that's where we're going to go. Thank you. Um, no, I'm sorry, Tony. Well, I, being somebody who studies the individual psychology of, of dolphins uh, to the extent that we can, um, as, as we mentioned, they have culture and uh, unique cultures, dialects. They also are individuals, and some individuals, uh, perhaps similar to some humans and other animals, respond differently to a life of captivity and perhaps to the trauma of seeing their parents killed in front of them during a capture or uh, chronic stress and <coughs> living in such acute situations as most captive facilities do. So those individuals may not be, they may be traumatized. For example, Tilikum, who is in Blackfish. Um, Tilikum is an orca who has undergone a lot of stress and is exhibiting abnormal behavior and aggression towards people. So we have to assess it them all individually, but there are always sanctuaries. We don't always have to have them jumping through hoops. We can give them the dignity they deserve to live as natural of a lifestyle as we can and perhaps learn more in the process ourselves about them. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is very similar, only it's uh, should captive-born cetaceans be released into the wild? And why don't we start with Tony? We're going to move this around a little bit. Uh, I would say, again, it's a very individual, depending on the species, bottlenose dolphin, resident orca, transient orca. There are all these unique cultures and individuals. Uh, I would say that uh, there's perhaps an opportunity, but we always have to leave the choice up to the animal to come back. We owe them that much, and to give them sanctuary if they need so. Okay, thank you. Jean-Michel? Well, unlike uh, the experience I had when I was a teenager, there were three different kinds of behavior on the part of one species of dolphins. Uh, the ones that could not tolerate being in jail, the other ones who, uh, they, they were, kind of accepting it and others that were sick, sick of it uh, privately. And uh, so every creature is different. And uh, I think we need to respect that and any animals in captivity today needs to be treated based on what uh, the, their behavior is all about, where their choices <coughs> are all about. And the ones that are uh, damaged or injured or have been there for a long time, we have to take care of them until they leave us, but we need to do it with respect and stop making them things that will agitate them, get them mad, just like if you're in jail and the guy who's taking care of you one day is irritating you, you're going to punch him in the face. Well, that's what happened with the trainers, and I feel very sorry for those who have been affected and some of them who have died. Thank you. Naomi? Well, I think I answered that question when I responded earlier. I think that captive-born animals have been born and raised in a very abnormal culture. And I think it's highly unlikely they would re-enter a natural society effectively. But I do think all captive cetaceans can be retired from a life of performance and be given um, a more natural uh, retirement and a more dignified life than performing in circuses. So that's, that's really what I want to see. Thank you. Um, I can speak a little bit about uh, captive-born cetaceans, actually not cetaceans, but pinnipeds. Um, some years ago, the director of the St. Louis Zoo said, we've got two captive-born sea lions, California sea lions, and uh, we can't find a home for them. Do you think we can release them into the wild? And I said, I don't, I don't know. It's never been done before. So we took the animals in and spent some time training them to catch their own fish. We tagged them with very distinctive <coughs> tags and released them into the wild. One of them was seen about six months later, doing very well, and another one a year later. Now, these are an entirely different animal, but let's not give up on, on developing the means to be able to release even captive-born animals back into the wild. We proved it could be done, 
at least with pinnipeds. And admittedly, they're a different creature, but we did do that, and it was successful. So let's not uh, give up on that one. Let's just learn as much as we can and see what we can do to make this work. I certainly agree with if they're not going to be in the in the acts and so on and the, the various shows that have as natural and pleasant a life for them as possible if they have to remain in captivity. But if there's an option of getting them back in the wild, training them to where they can interact successfully, I'm all for it. Okay, next question is, uh, <laughs> um, if the proposed legislation to ban orcas in captivity in California is uh, successful, what's going to happen to the orcas? What are they going to do with them? And maybe, uh, let's see, well, let's start with Jean-Michel. We're going to move this around a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> the ones that are uh, captive, unless they've been recently uh, put in jail, uh, I think they need to be taken care of. They need to stop doing uh, circus acts. Uh, we need to explain to the public uh, that this is where we're going to go, and this is how with uh, new technology like Triotech, for example, we can now have the people make decisions rather than being spectators. They become actors. And uh, to me, that's uh, a very, very nice way of doing the transition to keep these big corporation in business and for us to be educated. And uh, that would be my approach, uh, whether I sit down with uh, the head of uh, the, these uh, companies or governments. Thank you. Uh, Tony? Uh, I think this legislation, proposed legislation, is incredibly important. I, I don't know if all of you know uh, about the bill we're t discussing. And perhaps, if I may defer to Naomi, uh, who's been uh, instrumental in developing the language, this bill, if I may at this point. Yes, how many are aware of AB 2140? Yeah. It was uh, introduced by Richard Bloom. It is a very simple bill. It will prohibit the public display of killer whales for the purposes of performance or entertainment. It will prohibit captive breeding. It will prohibit artificial insemination. It will prohibit import and export into and out of the state of whales and their genetic material. It will effectively lead to the 10 whales that are currently being held in San Diego being the last 10 whales held captive in the state of California. That is its purpose. It will also mandate that the 10 killer whales that are currently being held in San Diego be retired to sea pen facilities and evaluated for release according to the best available science. Those last two provisions are the ones that are being pushed back on the hardest by legislators to date. And I think it's because there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what would happen to those 10 whales. There's absolutely no interest in just dumping them into the ocean and walking away from them. And there are people who think that that's what this bill will do. One of the whales was wild caught over 40 years ago, her name is Corky. She comes from the British Columbian population that I studied. Her mother was alive when I was studying these whales, but she has since died. But her family is still alive. And so I think it's only fair to Corky, who has been in captivity for over 40 years, to send her home and allow her to be retired to a sea pen there. And if she is recognized by her family, and her family recognizes her, to potentially release her. However, after 40 years, I'm not sure that will be possible. It will be up to Corky. The others were either wild caught, there's two wild caught, other wild caught whales there, Ulysses and Kasatka, and the rest were captive born. Kasatka is the mother of three of the whales, so even though she's wild caught, the idea of releasing her without her offspring is pretty much not on the table. So what we're proposing is building a sea pen off the coast of California and retiring the whales there. SeaWorld can build it, and then they get to keep control of the whales, they get to keep charging admission to seeing retired whales in a natural sea pen, and they get to keep making money off of them. SeaWorld can refuse to build it, and then they will lose control of the whales, and the whales will still be retired to a sea pen if somebody else builds it, 
and SeaWorld doesn't get to charge admission and make money off of them. So I think it's really pretty obvious that if this bill passes in its current form, SeaWorld would be very spiteful not to build a sea pen, and they certainly have the money to do it. So that's sort of where I'm coming from on this bill. There's no telling whether that language will remain intact, even if the bill moves forward. There has been a lot of pushback on it. And I'm a pragmatist, and I've done this sort of thing before with politics, and I know you sometimes have to negotiate things away. The things that are not on the table for negotiation are end to breeding, end to artificial insemination, and end to import and export. These 10 whales will be the last 10 whales in California. I have a question for the audience, and uh, I, raise your hand if you've seen blackfish. How many have seen blackfish? Most of you, or some of you, and so on. And the question to ask yourself, I'm not going to ask everybody who raised his or her hand, is, is if you felt that blackfish was an objective, impartial presentation of that issue. Uh, that's just a hypothetical question. I, I like to get people to think about issues as you've probably noticed by now. We want to go into the public session now of asking people, uh, having people ask questions of the panelists, but please keep the questions to questions. We don't, there's a lot of people who have questions for the panelists, and please address the panelists, the particular panelists you want to answer the question, unless you want the panel at large to, to answer a particular question. Keep it civil and and do not uh, ramble on with a monologue about your own agenda. And the same thing for the panelists. Please answer the, correct, the, the uh, question directly. Don't go off on tangents. You've got a lot of questions, a lot of involvement, which is wonderful, but we need to keep this moving. Because Greg uh, from the museum here Again, it's going to collect $10,000 a head for the museum <laughs> if we go beyond 8.30. Uh, the lady all the way in the back. Can you stand up? Can you stand up? It just helps us here. And who is she? Can I ask Tony, um, what can we uh, people do to get this bill passed? Could you help us, please? Because I'm dying to do this. Well, absolutely. I, I will say something about this bill. I will if I may, Anne, uh, defer also to Naomi because she's more direct, intimately involved. But yes, there is a lot that can be done at this time. We are in a new era. This is an apex situation politically, and, and it's beautiful. Um, just at something else that I think can be done that could perhaps support the bill, we haven't had a chance to even discuss this, Malibu, just in February, uh, had a city uh, proclamation. They enacted a city proclamation in part based on the personhood of dolphins and the new science uh, supporting that uh, that says they want to protect dolphins and whales from captivity. Perhaps other areas in, in California could do that. I would uh, ask uh, my fellow panelists if that would help, but absolutely now is a great time to support that bill, make a huge difference. So what you can do is um, persuade your assembly person to, um, your assembly member to vote for the bill. It will be heard in uh, committee on April 29th. That's the current date. Uh, there'll be a lobbying day before that. Any of you who want to go to Sacramento on the lobbying day, it'll go around by social media. People will know about it who will be able to tell you what that day will be. It's not, it's not scheduled yet. And if you want to go to Sacramento and participate in the lobbying day, that will be key. If you want to go to Sacramento and be there at the hearing, that will be key. The more people who show up supporting the bill, the more likely the legislators will vote for it. And right now, urging your assembly member, who is, is, is I understand, DOS, um, to uh, vote for it is, is what you should be doing. And um, you can also target, if you would like, with letters or um, phone calls, the committee members. And um, if you give me your contact information or if I give you my card and you contact me, I can give you, you know, all of the names of those uh, assembly members. Okay. Um, I'd like uh, in the future when a question is asked, it's because of the acoustics here, if 
the panelist who has asked could repeat the question first for the benefit of the audience, uh, myself included, who don't hear worth a damn anymore. I've been a diver for, I don't know, since 1954, 50 years? Almost as long as Jean-Michel. I'll show you my barnacles after this, the program if you like. <laughs> so please repeat the question, panelists. And I think Hillary has been raising her hand repeatedly. Well, uh, w what, what do I suggest and what do we suggest we do with uh, whales in captivity, right? That's your first yeah, question. Whales. And yeah. uh, I think those whales, again, as it was mentioned, they need to be taken care of. And some of them, uh, they're all different. Some of them may be able to be released. Other ones, you have to take care of them until it's over. But we need to stop making them do circus act because it's anti-educational, and as far as they're concerned, uh, if you look at most of the time, they do what they are told to do or they don't get fed. So it's, you know, reward and punishment. Enough. That has to stop. And uh, other than that, I think it's great to know that uh, these uh, legislation or that legislation will not allow any whales to come in, any whales to uh, be exported uh, because we want to be responsible here for what we have done. And I totally believe that these industries, they are industries, will survive by being able to, one, organize whale watching. You can go out there and see them. And two, if you live away from these places, you can travel, but if you cannot travel, you have the ability to have in 3D the most spectacular images of these creatures which you can never see by yourself or in the wild or certainly in captivity. So the technology today is such that, you know, I'm working today <clears throat> on an IMAX show which uh, will feature not whales. People have done that already, but there's a lot to be done. But for me to show you things I've never seen after 68 years of diving because of that new technology is one of the most exciting time in my life. And uh, when it comes to whales, same thing can be done. So uh, the, the public should choose these exciting opportunities that are being made available to us today. I think um, for the 10 whales that are in San Diego, we're talking about um, preventing and, and them from... And the question was, oh, Naomi? I'm answering the first question, what should we do with those whales? Uh, the first, uh, so the, the first question is, what should we do with those whales? They shouldn't be allowed to breed. And you asked, should we separate the males and the females? That's the most basic way that you can prevent them from breeding. Three of them are related to Kasatka, you know, so they shouldn't... You know, two, two of them are males. They shouldn't be mating with their mother. So there are contraceptives that can be used. I was just talking to a veterinarian today about that. They aren't necessarily safe for long-term use. My feeling is, is that if they have, if it's legislated that they have to develop this sort of contraception, they'll get clever and they'll do it. So they've never had any incentive to do it in the past. They want these animals to breed. So they've never bothered coming up with anything more than a short-term solution to the breeding problem, the, the contraception problem. So I think that they'll come up with something long-term if they are forced to, but quite frankly. In terms of um, what will happen to them, you know, physically, I think that the C-Pen option is very real, and it will allow them a more natural um, and a more dignified life. But if that never happens because the coastal zone, uh, the coastal commission doesn't allow it or whatever, um, then they will stay at SeaWorld, and instead of doing the circus show, they can do what I call demonstrations, which are more low-key, less um, rigid, less scheduled, uh, more, if you will, random interactions with the trainers that actually are more educational and less spectacular, you know, because that's just ridiculous. Those shows are ridiculous, and they're not educational. 
And then you also asked, and I'll, I'll just get to the next question about zoos, you know, and their value. Um, I do not believe that if orcas or dolphins or even pinnipeds are suddenly not held in captivity anymore, that everybody's going to go back to shooting them the next day. I think that's a little ridiculous. Will we lose our appreciation for them over time? No child's ever been to space, but they all want to be astronauts at some point or other. No child has ever, um, you know, uh, been to the bottom of the ocean, and yet, you know, we have many who want to be explorers, you know. And then as far as, you know, other species, how many people have seen a humpback whale in a tank? Absolutely none, and yet they love humpback whales. The paradigm that you have to see the living animal to appreciate, to appreciate it is actually fairly outdated. As Jean-Michel has been saying, we have some amazing technology now. And I think you can inspire a child without having to exploit an animal. Uh, uh, I think Tony is next. I, Naomi and Jean-Michel covered a lot of the points. You know, the Save the Whales movement was perhaps one of the largest and most significant conservation efforts in the world, yet there was never a full-grown Pub, you know, whale uh, in public display. And so um, some people actually question educators, and scientists and others, whether or not seeing these animals in captivity actually sometimes imparts a negative and exploitive education, educational message, that it's okay to take these animals and ask them to do stupid animal tricks and treat them as if they were domestic pets at best. And so, for example, you know, going to a petting zoo, usually people are not going to become vegetarians after that. Um, and so we have so many opportunities now to have new experiences, regardless of the past. What if children now can experience what it's like to let dolphins and orcas be in sanctuaries? What an amazing educational opportunity that would be. The question was about Lolita, who is the lone orca that um, Tony mentioned earlier, who is at the Miami Seaquarium. She is part of LPOD, which is in the southern resident community off the coast of Washington State. And that population was designated as endangered in 2005. NOAA, has, NOAA being the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has proposed listing her as part of that uh, population. She was originally excluded, very explicitly excluded, from the listing in 2005, and they're proposing to reconsider that. So the comet period, unfortunately, closes on Friday. So um, at that point, unless you are able to get your comment in in the next two days, the public um, opportunity to comment on it will have closed. They have received over 14,000 comments. So I think they really have heard from the public. They know how the public feels. We want her listed and we want her to be removed from that incredibly abusive situation once she's considered part of an endangered species. So I'm submitting my comments on Friday. They will speak specifically to the legal aspects. So um, I, unfortunately, you know, you, you have two days now to get your public comment in. And just go to the NOAA website and you'll be able to find that information. Can you describe a little bit what the CPM uh, looks like? Well, as, as Jean-Michel and I know very well, you know... Please but, repeat the uh, question. The question was Sorry, about Naomi. sea pens. <laughs> what will they look like? How much will they cost? You know, what's the engineering behind this sort of endeavor? You know... Yeah, yeah. So, um, basically, uh, for Keiko, the engineering was developed to build a, a, a very large, larger than a football field-sized sea pen that also had a medical pool, you know, engineered into it, which meant that a false bottom could be risen and, and Keiko could be held in shallow water to be dealt with it from a veterinary perspective. And it was expensive, there's no doubt about it, but it was also very, very sophisticated, and I'm not sure every sea pen needs to be that sophisticated. Ultimately, he was actually released into the bay that the sea pen was placed in with just a net strung across the mouth of the bay, and he had access to the entire area. And the sea pen, which was smaller at that point because it had been broken in half, more or less, during a storm, became the medical pen. 
And so I think that the engineering has been developed through the Keiko project. Where it will be located is, is you know, something that needs to be evaluated. How big should it be? Well, if it's going to hold 10 animals in a, in a situation that's better than where they are, it's going to have to be fairly large, surface area-wise. Um, it'll always be deeper. Those tanks are not deep. Nobody should be fooled by that. The deepest tank at SeaWorld is only 30, 30 feet deep, 35 feet deep. So um, it'll have to be fairly open in terms of surface area. And in terms of the cost, initial capital investment, a few million maybe at the most, and that's really the worst case scenario. Could be as cheap as a million, but SeaWorld puts 10 million into its renovations whenever they do renovations. They have the money. And again, by the way, we are not talking about closing SeaWorld down. The question was, what is it so, what's so special about these animals? Why are we so concerned about them? First of all, they are not fish, and they are mammals, and they are perhaps the most social, most tightly family bonded species on the planet, even more than we are. They live in family groups for life. They live as long as we do, and so that's a long time that they live in these family groups. Uh, there are differences in how, they, how tightly bonded they are, depending on where you're talking about, but they all stay in family groups. And in some cases, the males stay with their families for life. Right? Daughters start having their own calves and develop their own maternal groups. But when you see a big adult male, two adult males, three adult males, swimming with an adult female, they are her sons. And so when you put them in captivity and you separate calves from their mothers, that's an incredible trauma. When you put them in captivity and they die, young. It's because the tanks are too small. They are not just large, they are very large. They are social, intelligent, far-ranging, socially complex predators, and they cannot be provided for in a concrete tank. And I've been studying them in the wild, and I've been dealing with them in captivity for over 25 years, and that's the conclusion I drew 20 years ago. And finally, the public is reaching the same conclusion based on a lot of different sources of information including blackfish, but not solely blackfish. And I, I just think it's something that we need to start recognizing that you cannot teach people about conservation. You cannot tell the truth about conservation with lies. The fact is they don't live longer in captivity. The fact is, is that they do live for, together for, you know, in family groups for life in the wild, and they don't in captivity. The fact is is a 135-foot-long and 80-foot-wide tank is one ten thousandth of a percent the size of their home range in the wild. So these are all aspects that make them uniquely unsuited to being confined in captivity. There are several species out there that are in the same boat. Elephants, too big, too wide ranging to be held in captivity. Chimpanzees and other primates. Okay, we're too starting to wander here. No, I'm, I'm just trying I to answer you. your question. You're right. Uh, do any of the other panelists have anything? I do agree with you, but Jean-Michel, anything well, to add? You know, they're warm-blooded creatures. <coughs> they are very social, and as you say, and you know, I'm not a scientist. Uh, they, they have relationships, and they live in the family, and they live in a pod, and uh, when, uh, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, when uh, a young male wants to uh, mate, uh, he's going to go to another pod to mate, and he's going to come back with mom for the rest of his life. And uh, uh, when a decision is made to attack anything uh, for food, the females, it is a matriarchal society, decide, let's go, we need food now. They don't kill for uh, anything else other than food. And. Uh, to me, uh, we can learn a lot, and it's fascinating, and they have nothing to do with fish. Fish are cold blood, and uh, they uh, don't live the same kind of life that uh, these animals live. So, and, they, and you know, when you look at the history of uh, uh, these marine mammals, dolphins and whales, <laughs> cetaceans, they used to be on land millions of years ago, long before we showed up on the planet. And they were 
moving around, and they adapted themselves. You look at a, a, a skeleton of the whales, you're going to see the hind legs are still there. They're not done with their evolution. I mean, we can learn so much and so exciting. And kids today, whether you take them out to see them in the wild, or you take them and see a, a very beautiful motion picture where you're going to have the behavior which takes months or years to, to put together, like my father has done about other things, uh, they will be much, much better decision makers. And I can assure you, they will never be people in the industry of captive animals or in government who will do what we do today. <coughs> So I will summarize my perspective on dolphins and whales after studying them for roughly 30 years, or should I say I've been learning from them, not just about them. We are in the presence of other conscious, intelligent, perhaps brilliant, sentient beings on this planet. And science is now finally catching up to that reality. And this is supported by neurobiological evidence, behavioral evidence, um, so many examples. To be concise, these beings and these cultures, we have a lot we can learn from them. Orcas can exhibit, I'll just give this one example, some of the most peaceful family cohabitation without strife overtly in the group. I mean, really peaceful societies that so many humans can even learn from. So these are very <coughs> developed beings, and it doesn't mean they're better than other animals, but they are definitely unique. Um, I'd like to add one thing to these comments. I, I, as I mentioned, I've been involved with uh, commercial collection 40-some uh, years ago, and, and a lot with rehabbing these animals. Um, and I have worked with whales and dolphins as well as seals, sea lions, sea otters, sea turtles, etc. cetera. Uh, marine mammals are highly intelligent. And as such, we have abundant evidence of, of their intelligence. They're much smarter than fish. And it's funny, but the more intelligent an animal is, the more subject it is to stress. We don't see fish getting ulcers to speak of, seriously. But we do see dolphins whales getting ulcers when they're in captivity. They are subject to, to stress. They are very, very intelligent. It's a strange thing about very intelligent animals is that they can succumb to things like ulcers. You're not gonna see an ulcer in a fish unless it's from a tumor or some kind of cancer or something from pollution or whatever. It's not gonna be from a stressful environment. So bear that in mind. We have time for one more question, and then Greg is going to start. I'm sorry, but Michael <laughs> was behind her. How many captive orcas are there worldwide? One. One, are we going to start dealing with the old issue of uh, dolphins as well? It's, I mean, it's the circus should be open. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the fact girl. So, yeah, uh, 54. There's 54 captive orcas in the world. 24 of them are here in the United States. And the rest are in Japan, France, Spain, uh, Argentina, and Canada. And now, Russia, which has these eight wild-caught animals I mentioned to you, two of which are in Moscow, four of which are in Vladivostok, and two of which were just sent to China. And it's quite possible the two that were sent to China are already dead. We are trying to find out. Um, I'm working in Russia and China to try to deal with those eight animals, now possibly six to try to get them repatriated to the Sea of Akokst. Um, in terms of when we're gonna start working on the other animals, on the other cetaceans, as a long time campaigner on this and, and a veteran of 20 years of this sort of policy work, one step at a time. Okay, thank you for that. I, I think this is gonna to have to be a, a wrap up. I'd give each uh, panelist maybe a minute, one minute, to say a few quick words here. No, I'm sorry, we're, we're stuck by this, otherwise it's $10,000 a piece. So uh, let's start with uh, Tony and, and Jean-Michel and then uh, Naomi, just one minute. Sum it up. 
Well, it's, it's so hard to sum up this discussion. First of all, uh, I think your questions were all very intelligent and very thoughtful. And we are in a unique situation to affect not only the individual lives of these animals, but the lives of all ocean inhabitants. And in saying that, I remind us that we're a coastal community. So we really share this coastal environment. And when we help, in my opinion, one dolphin, one pinniped, seal or sea lion, we're really helping everybody in our community, our shared coastal uh, environment. And so the individual does expand to the masses, whether it be fish, dolphins, orcas, every individual, in my opinion, and that of many conservation biologists now, does matter. So thank you. My father used to say, people protect what they love. I used to look at him and say, how can you protect what you don't understand? Today, we're starting to understand our mission is, if you protect the ocean, you protect yourself. This is what it's all about. It's not the issue of protecting dolphins, whales, or sharks, or, or fish. It's ourselves. And being able to look in the eyes of our kids and say, I will do everything I can so you will have the same privilege that we have had. That's our mission. A lot of people ask me, particularly my fellow, um, my colleagues in the scientific community, why are you concentrating on 54 whales and 1,500 dolphins and, you know, what about all the hundreds of thousands of animals being harmed out in the wild? And the reason why I focus so hard on the public display issue, although I also work on those animals in the wild, is because millions of people know anything they know and everything they know about these animals by going to places like SeaWorld. And if they are not being told the truth, and if they are not getting accurate information, there is a problem. And I feel very strongly that the paradigm that we have to see them in the, in, in the flesh to be educated about them, and these facilities are doing so much good for conservation and education, has got to be challenged. Because the oceans are only getting into worse shape, even after 50 years of places like SeaWorld being around. So I actually think it's hard, high, much more likely that they are part of the problem rather than part of the solution because they are not telling people the truth about what captivity does to these animals and what needs to be done to protect them in the wild. I want SeaWorld to stay in business. I want it to evolve. I want it to do what it says it's doing. And it, that must start with not exploiting these animals anymore. Well, tonight I had to be the bad guy. I had to say, think about what's being said and get both sides. And I presented some views of the other side um, and some things just to ponder, each of you to ponder and so on. And also had the uh, difficult task of trying to keep everybody on track and in focus. And so I do apologize if I uh, cut anybody off or made it too short, but we are on a, type, a very tight timeline here. Uh, having said all that, Hiroko Binko has uh, done a marvelous job of organizing this event. Thank you so much, Hiroko. And thank you very much to the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum for providing this great venue. And, and thank you for a great audience. Uh, you asked a lot of wonderful questions. Thank you so much.